reports from Africa still coming in. We uh, got word still getting reports from actually last year from some of our students that hadn't reported yet. Uh, during the month of January, probably over 50 baptisms, but the reports that we got from last year tied in with it made it over a thousand baptisms. So that thousand baptisms reported, over a thousand restored, uh, eight new congregations built or uh, established. Rather, there's a chart, a little poster we brought. As you go out the door there, you look over to the left. I leaned it up on the top of the table there. A picture of some of the church buildings that we were able to build last year, and I think the one that's on the right hand side at the top is the one that you guys built. So you can see that. And we left a picture of it on the bulletin board over there as well. <clears throat> Good things happening at the schools. Preacher schools, we're getting new students in. The one in Malawi has 26 new preachers in. That's the largest number we've ever had. So we're excited about that. The one in Zambia, uh, Livingston, has 30. And then some of the others are waiting for the students to get in. So we're hoping to have good uh, good numbers present. <clears throat> They've been uh, trying to deliver some relief food to help uh, some of the areas that there's droughts. They sent some pictures of that this morning. And I was showing Gary a video they sent me uh, of the floods. Still, this is in their rainy season, and they were going out to look at one of the new church buildings, areas where they were going to build them. And they, the road stops, and there's about a, a football field <laughs> lake in front of them that they can't get through it. And in those areas, they don't have bridges, those old dirt roads. So every little creek that you can jump across during uh, most of the time of the year, it'll be wider than the other side of the pavement uh, during the rainy season. So that slows them down a whole lot. So uh, we'll, we'll be reporting more about that. Uh, some <coughs> bags of clothing we brought. So we're <coughs> thankful for that. We've got over 100 boxes packed for this next uh, one that's going to Kenya. And we'll be talking to you about that coming up uh, soon as well. Open your Bibles to Acts 13. That's where we are this morning, Acts chapter 13. And in the book of Acts, we've looked at the establishment of the church. We've looked at a few of the events that's taken place, the miracles. We've looked at the conversion of the household of Cornelius and now the gospels for everybody. Now we're beginning a new portion of the book of Acts that will be from 13 on to the end of the book of Acts. And that is the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. And we're, we're introduced to that. Uh, we're told here in chapter 13, verse 1, about their uh, going and the church that is in Antioch. We're introduced to, to Antioch here. Uh, there's two Antiochs in the New Testament that we read about. Antioch of Syria. Now, if you look at your map, in your mind, or turn over to the <coughs> back of it and actually look at it. <clears throat> if you look at Palestine as it runs uh, north and south, uh, as far as the size, we, we've mentioned this before, if you take the state of Tennessee, which is <coughs> east to west, and you cut about a third of Tennessee off, and then turn it up, and set it up like you would a bottle, that's about the size of Palestine. Palestine's about two-thirds the size of the state of Tennessee. So if you were to go up the coast of the Mediterranean, all the way up as high as you can go on the Mediterranean Sea, and then the land starts turning west, right in there, that general area is where Antioch of Syria is. And Antioch of Syria is about 30 miles from the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the city of Seleucia is about 15 miles there. Uh, Antioch, and then there's also another Antioch of Prasida, which is in the... Uh, part over more so to the west, which would be what we would call, or the Bible calls Asia Minor. Uh, it would be modern day uh, Turkey and some of those areas in that uh, part of the world is where uh, uh, Antioch of uh, Poseidon would be. But this Antioch of Syria uh, was founded about 300 B.C. by Seleucius I. And uh, it was named after his father, uh, Antiochus, so they just cut the latter part off of it and called it Antioch instead of Antiochus. It served as the Roman uh, province, sort of the capital in that general region. It's the third largest city in the Roman Empire. Rome's the largest. Alexandria, Egypt is number two, and then Antioch of Syria is number three. 
a very beautiful, beautiful city. Uh, the main street, we're told by historians, that the main street that ran through Antioch was about two miles long. It was paved in marble. If you can imagine the road paved in marble. And on either side, there were huge columns that supported balconies and terraces that people had hanging things from. So it's very, very ornate and very, very beautiful. There was a temple of Armitus there, one of their pagan temples. It was also a big enough city that it had an amphitheater. And you remember Rome and some of the other places where they had their amphitheaters, where they had their Olympics and where they persecuted Christians later on. So it is a very, very uh, big, important city. Had a lot of different philosophers there, a lot of different cults, and they prided themselves for being tolerant. You know, you always, uh, you hear that today, that there's so many people out there that's tolerant, you know. They just get along with anything and everybody. Nothing's wrong. But it was a, a city that the church existed there, and it was made up of Jews and Gentiles, which was sort of unique because uh, a lot of the congregations hadn't really integrated to the Gentiles yet. And except for Jerusalem, Antioch is probably the most important city in regard to the church that we read about. And you remember that verse in Acts 11? And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. That, that's here. Yeah. And all of Paul's missionary journeys basically starts from Antioch. It's, it's such a large city, and the church is uh, pretty powerful there. So he goes there, and it's, where it's located, he just has to go west uh, just a few miles to get to the Mediterranean Sea, and then they go on and do those journeys. In verse 1, he talks about certain of the prophets and teachers. He lists Barnabas. He lists several there in the... Uh, uh, first verse. And you remember from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10, he lists those miraculous gifts. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of prophets. Prof prof um, he said, uh, discerning of spirits, rather. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. So, these miraculous gifts. You had prophets in the first century. Since the Bible wasn't written, we've always had the Word of God ever since the church started. We've had the Word of God. It was either in the spoken form and later it would be in the written form. But they always had it. And that's why the apostles would lay hands on people and impart spiritual gifts. And they could go out and tell people what the Bible says before the Bible was written. They told them the Word of God. And then as it was written, it's the same thing. They told them how to worship. They told them what to do to be Christians. And then it was all completed before 100 A.D. <clears throat> so you have prophets. Uh, some of these offices of the first century were permanent. Some of them were temporary. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, beginning with verse 11, And he gave some to be apostles, and some to be prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the working of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now how long are they going to last? Verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. There's unity is mentioned and knowledge is mentioned. And all things that pertain to life and God is given in the Bible. You look at those offices, some of them are temporary, some of them are permanent. For example, he gave some to be apostles. Do we have apostles in the church today? Well, no. No, we don't have apostles in the church today. And he gave some to be prophets. Do we have any prophets in the church today? No. Well, prophets taught, but prophets did more than teach. They prophesied of events that were going to come to pass, and they also told people miraculously the Word of God. And then we have evangelists. Do we have evangelists today? Yeah, that's preachers. Teachers. Pastors. Pastors are not preachers. Pastors are elders. Shepherds, pastors, bishops, presbyters, overseers, elders. These different Greek words that's used in the Bible to refer to that office. And teachers. Not teachers in, in the uh, church today. So some of these are permanent. Some of them are, uh, are 
excuse me, some of these were not to be permanent, and uh, some of them were temporary. And you have some that they're not going to last until the Word of God is completed, and then you have others as long as the, the world stands, as long as there's the, the church is here, those offices will be uh, in use. And uh, he talks about uh, as they ministered to the Lord, they fasted, and the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas, and Saul, for the work where do I have called them. Here in verse 2, <clears throat> they are fasting. That's an interesting study in and of itself. Fasting was never commanded, but fasting was, re fasting was regulated. Jesus talked about that <clears throat> in Matthew 6, verses 14 through 16. He said, when you fast, he said, uh, don't, uh, don't make yourself to appear that you're suffering. You know, don't, don't mess your hair up and ruffle your clothes and go, oh, I'm just, oh, I fasted for 10 days now. You know, don't, don't be boasting or bragging about that. Just like he said, don't stand on the corner and say, hey, everybody watch me. I'm about to give some money to the poor. Are you, are you watching me? Look, look, I'm about to do it. He said, don't, you don't give. That's not the way you give. But when you fast, if you fast, there's some regulations that are there. We're not commanded to fast. But a lot of times in the New Testament, when people were coming up on big decisions or something very important in their life, they fasted. You remember when the Lord appeared to Saul and he found out he'd been persecuting Christians he, he was three days without sight. He was fasting. He, food wasn't very important to him. Food's important to us most of the time. But you know, a lot of times in our lives, at the death of a loved one, you, you just almost have to twist somebody's arm to make them eat. They don't eat. I'm not hungry. Here's some big important thing that's going to happen, a big decision in my life. I'm not hungry. I don't eat. And here they have people that's thinking about some things, maybe some spiritual things, and they're fasting and praying. And that's what Paul and Barnabas is doing. And Barnabas, they were separated for the work whereunto I have called them. You remember Acts 9, verse 15? Acts 22, 21, and Acts 26, 16 through 18. It tells in those three accounts of the conversion of Saul that the Lord appeared unto him to make him a minister and a servant <coughs> and an apostle. The Lord had a work in mind for Paul. He was going to be the apostle. Now think about it. He's probably the most educated Jew that was alive, and he's going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Not to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. The Lord's going to send him out to the Gentiles. So they fasted, they prayed, and they laid hands on them. Well, sometimes that, that laying on of hands, that's an interesting study in and of itself as well. <clears throat> we, we see that in the Bible sometimes, Spiritual gifts are imparted through the laying on the apostles' hands. But that's not what's going on here. They laid hands on Paul and Barnabas. They didn't give Paul anything. <laughs> Paul's an apostle. He, he couldn't get anything from them. He already had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But a lot of times in the Bible, this is sort of a symbolic gesture of uh, the idea of approval. Our approval. We're, we're laying hands on this man. Uh, we're approved. Or we're sending him on a commission. You know, you're going to pray, and you're going to lay hands on him, and you're going to say, Lord, bless him as he goes out, and this is his task. And you're not, you're not giving him anything. It's just sort of a gesture that was done uh, sometimes uh, during those particular days. And then uh, they being sent forth with the Holy Ghost, they departed unto Seleucia. As I said, they're about 10, 15 miles Antioch down to Seleucia. They're getting closer to the Mediterranean Sea. And from thence they sailed to Cyprus. The Isle of Cyprus, if you look on your map and you look at the Mediterranean Sea and run all the way up to where the land is, about where Assyria, uh, Antioch is, that little island out there is uh, the Isle of Cyprus. And there's two main cities on the Isle of Cyprus. And he's going to be going to those. We're going to be reading about those here in the next few verses. They came to uh, Salmas, that's, that's one of them. That one is on the eastern side of the island. And there uh, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John to their ministry. This is John Mark. Not the apostle John. This is John Mark. And we're going to read about him a little bit later. That says that they preached in the synagogues. Now a lot of folks today 
when they go through the book of Acts and they find Paul and others preaching in the synagogues, uh, they try to tell us that Paul is still a Jew. He's, he's worshiping in the Jewish faith. That's, he's going to the synagogue. And that's, that's why you would go to the synagogue because it's the Sabbath and Jews go to the Sabbath. So he's a Christian and a Jew. No. Now, why does he go to the synagogue? Because the people gather there. That's right. And he is a Jew by heritage, his background. And one of the customs was when you come into the synagogue, and every city, basically, that had a pretty good sized population, uh, could have a Jewish synagogue. They would build a little place, and they would come on Saturday or the Sabbath, and they would read the scriptures in Hebrew. They would read the Old Testament scriptures. And after somebody maybe would stand up and read for 30 minutes or an hour or whatever, take turns reading, then the custom was to say, do any of you men have anything you'd like to say? Ooh, give Paul the opportunity. <laughs> Paul, do you have anything you'd like to say? I sure do, every time. He's going to get up and he's going to tell them about Jesus. And he's very knowledgeable in the Old Testament. So he's going to go back and look at some of the Old Testament scriptures and bring out some things that they would agree with and bring them along. And then he's going to give them some prophecies and try to help them see this amazing message about Jesus. So that's why he goes to the synagogue. Not because he's a Jew worshiping under the Jewish synagogue, but because he has an opportunity. And what's wrong with being the place where they read the scriptures? You know what? That'd be a wonderful opportunity if the town I live in Cook, Tennessee, if, if they met somewhere in a school building or a place every Saturday and they read the scriptures for about an hour and said, any of you men have anything to say? I'd like to be there. <laughs> I'd get up. I think I have a few things I'd like to say. And that wouldn't mean that I'm you know, compromising the truth. I'd be there to help them see the truth. And from uh, verse 5, Simon, they preached the synagogue and then they had gone through into the aisle unto Paphos. And this is on the western side of the island. If you look at the little island, you got one up over here, the other one over there. They're sort of on the southern part. So they're probably sailing down the, the southern part of the island. They go over there. They've gone through Paphos. And they found a certain sorcerer. Verse 6. He is called a sorcerer. He's called a false prophet. He is a Jew. And his name is Bar-Jesus. Now, what does the word bar mean when you see the word bar in front of a name? Do you remember in Acts 16 when the Lord said, when, when Peter said, uh, you're the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. So here's Bar-Jesus. He's the son of Jesus. Or that word is used in the New Testament many times translated Joshua. Jesus was about a common name. Joshua was about as common name as John is today. Pretty, pretty common. So he is Bar Jesus, or the son of Joshua. And we're introduced to him. And he is a sorcerer. He's not the first sorcerer we read about in the book of Acts, is he? No. We read about Simon in Acts 8. Simon the sorcerer, who bewitched the people. Now, what, what do sorcerers do? Smoke and mirrors. Yeah. They trick people. They deceive people. They either use magic arts or some form of deception. They don't work real miracles. You remember in the Old Testament when Pharaoh, uh, Moses went before Pharaoh and he cast his rod down and it became a serpent and they cast theirs down? Well, they cast something down that looked like a rod, but uh, they didn't really turn the rod into a serpent. And after about the first two or three of those miracles, you remember those magicians said, this is the finger of God. We, we can't do that. You know, you can pull a rabbit out of a hat if you've got a hat with a secret compartment in it or you can stick your hand through the bottom of it and pull a rabbit out of your, your belt or your shirt or coat. But you, you can't do real miracles. They couldn't heal the sick. They couldn't raise the dead. And we got fakes today that claim they can do that, but they can't. So he's a fake. He's a fake. He is Bar Jesus, or he's called Elimaeus, the sorcerer. He is a wizard. He is a trickster. He is a false prophet. Now, what did the Old Testament say? This involves witchcraft a lot of times as well. A lot of these sorcerers and all, they were, they were involved in witchcraft. What did the Old Testament say that you were supposed to do with witches? Do you remember? Did they burn? Put them to death. 
That's exactly right. Leviticus 19, verse 31. Leviticus 20 and verse 16. Uh, Exodus 22, verse 18. There's a host of passages. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. And, and that was interesting in uh, American history. Up in the New England places, Plymouth Rock area, when they came over from Great Britain and they burned all those witches. They burned several people and several dogs and cats. They burned them as well because they accused them of being witch. And I, I remember reading in one of the guys' um, journals that was printed, and he said when somebody was accused of being a witch, they had certain tests that they would perform before they killed them uh, as being a witch. And one of the things they would do sometimes is they would say, all right, quote the 23rd Psalm. Prove you're not a witch. And they, most of those folks were Bible readers and they would quote it. And I remember they were he was telling about one lady that was very knowledgeable of the Bible. And they said, quote the 23rd Psalm. She quoted word for word, didn't miss a word. And they said, all right, quote uh, Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, quote verses so and so and so. She quoted every verse and didn't miss a word. He said, ah, she's a witch. Nobody can quote all those without missing one word. <laughs> so if you miss a word, you're a witch, we'll learn you. And if you get them all right, aha, uh -huh, that proves you're a witch because an ordinary human couldn't quote that many without missing a purpose. And they, they murdered, killed. And that was a horrible, horrible thing because those folks weren't really witches in our history, but these, these folks here uh, were practicing these uh, curious arts and different things. Uh, we were introduced to... Uh, the, the deputy of the country, now he's not a deputy like uh, Barney was a deputy. The word deputy there carries with the idea as acting governor. He is the chief official of that particular area. There's nobody higher than him uh, on that particular island. And, and what's he doing? Uh, Paul and Barnabas has an opportunity to talk to this fella this Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, he's a, a, an intelligent man, a man that's wanting to listen and hear what's being said. And he calls for them, and he wants to hear the Word of God. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Boy, I wish my phone rang every day if somebody called me, saying, I want to hear the Word of God. Come over here and talk to me. Tell me about the Word of God. So what a great opportunity. So Paul and Barnabas are about to speak the Word of God to that man. And Elamas, the sorcerer, for his name interpreted uh, by interpretation, he withstood them, speaking, or seeking rather, to turn away the deputy from the faith. Now, uh, he is a horrible fellow for doing that. That's just a terrible thing to try to do. And Saul said to him, or Paul, he's filled with the Holy Ghost, he said his eyes are open, he said, Oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, Thou child of the devil, thou enemy, enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right way of the Lord? Now look at some of the things that he said to him there. Uh, he said to him, you're full of subtlety. The idea there is deceit. It's the idea of a decoy. It's the idea of bait. You know, think about that. You use bait you set a trap with bait. If you're trying to catch a rabbit in a cage, you set a, a, a trap. Maybe put some lettuce or carrots out there. If you're trying to catch a, a, a wild animal, you put a piece of meat maybe out there. If we go fishing, we use bait. You put a nice juicy red worm on a hook and throw it out in the water and uh, the fish thinks it's food and he bites it and he's hung with a hook. He's, he's, he loses his life as a result of that. So here's the idea. Uh, he's full of deceit. He's filled. He's, he's, there's a decoy. There's bait here. And the devil uses bait, doesn't he? With us. The devil tries. He's got a lot of, you know, sometimes you go fishing, you have a tackle box. If they're not biting this one, they'll bite the other one. The devil knows that, doesn't he? Your, your problem may not be drugs. You may live all your life and never shoot any heroin in your vein or smoke a crack pipe. That may never be your problem. That doesn't mean you don't have a problem. That don't mean that there's not something that you would be tempted to do. Some folks never have a problem with gambling, drinking, lying, stealing. That's not their problem. But, you know, we all see them, don't we? There's something that the devil keeps throwing before us. There's a bait that he keeps throwing before us, 
and pow, just like that hungry bass hits that uh, lure. We're allowed to do that. The idea of tricks, this is sorcery, this is tricks. Now, this is interesting as well that he is referred to as a man that's very subtle, or subtility that's here. The very same word that's used in Genesis chapter 3 Amen. in regard to the devil. Now the devil, or Satan, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. You remember what he did? What the devil did? He, he takes the very fruit that God said don't eat of it, and he, he, tell, he tells Eve, well, there's nothing wrong with that fruit. Well, God knows that if you eat this fruit, you'll be as wise as him. That's trickery. That's deceit. That's a decoy. Well, if you eat this fruit, your eyes will be open. You'll be wise like him. He don't have your best interest in heart. And the devil even lied. God said, thou shalt not eat of the fruit. It's forbidden fruit. And the devil comes along and says, uh, yea, hath God said, thou shalt not eat of every fruit? In other words, uh, no, God didn't say that. He's lying. And that's, that's the way uh, that this false teacher is doing to Paul, or to uh, Sergius Paulus here in Acts chapter 13. Uh, also, he's referred to as, uh, he said, thou full of subtility and mischief. That word carries with it the idea of being reckless. It carries with it the idea of the idea of maybe even handling the word of God in sort of a deceitful fashion. He refers to him as the child of the devil. He's kin to the devil. And remember, Jesus said that to some folks on a different case. He said, you're of your father, the devil. But when you act like the devil, I guess it's all right to be referred to as a child of the devil. When you act like God, you ought to be referred to as a child of God, shouldn't you? The idea that you act like your spiritual father. We ought to want to be called children of God, but not a child of the devil, because we don't want to act like the devil. And notice he referred to him as an enemy of all righteousness. Everything that's right, everything that's good, everything that's pure and holy, he's against it. He stands against it. That's what the devil does. Revelation 21 and 8 also says that sorcerers are right there with the category yep. of people. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. The liars and sorcerers have their part in the lake of fire. That's exactly right. Notice also he said of him that he was perverting the right way, ways of the Lord. Perverting. The word pervert here means to distort. It carries with it the idea of corrupt, to turn away, to misinterpret is one of the Greek words for that word, to misinterpret. Now, do we have any folks today that misinterpret the Bible? Aren't they doing just exactly what uh, Sergius Paulus I mean, the Lord Jesus was doing here. Twisting around. Twisted around, yeah. Yeah, twisted around. The Lord didn't say that. Or they look at this verse, take it out of context. Look at that one, take it out of context. Perverting or distorting, misrepresenting. Notice also he said, the right way. The right ways, rather, of the Lord. Well, when we talk about the right ways of the Lord, doesn't that suggest there's some wrong ways? Why is it that everybody thinks that all roads lead to heaven? All roads are right. No? Straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and few there be that find Matthew 7. Broad is the way that leads to destruction and damnation. Many travel that way. Many are on the wrong road today. Not all roads are the right road. And uh, that's uh, a very important point here. He is perverting the right ways of the Lord. Also, uh, as we move on in verse 11, and now behold the hand of the Lord is upon me. That expression, the hand of the Lord, usually carries with it the idea of power. The Lord delivered the children of Israel with a mighty hand, an outstretched hand, suggesting the idea of power. And if we're talking about the Lord's hand, it, it, it's got to be the most powerful hand because the Lord's the most powerful uh, that we need to think about or talk about. So he talks about the hand of the Lord is upon you. In other words, what's about to happen is from the Lord. This is not me doing it. This is the power of God. You're going to be blind because of what you're doing. You're going to be blind not seeing the sun for a season. I don't know if that season there has reference to a crop season or if it has reference to a whole year season. It's hard to determine, but it's a period of time 
that the Lord has designated. It's not a permanent. You're not going to be blind for the rest of your life. But you're going to be blind. And every morning when he wakes up and he can't see a thing, he's going to know why that's happening. Because he stood against the Lord. And all during the day when somebody has to lead him around, he's going to know that he turned people, trying to turn people away from the Lord. And that's why that has happened and to him. He's going to be blind. And uh, immediately there fell on him a midst of darkness. And he went about seeing, seeking some to lead him by the hand. Most miracles that you read about in the New Testament are the opposite, aren't they? You're healing a blind man. Or you're restoring somebody the ability to walk. But here's a unique one. And this, this is God doing it. This is not something that Paul came up on his own with. It was the mighty hand of the Lord that did this. You're going to try to pervert my word. You're going to try to keep this man from hearing the truth. And this man can lose his soul because of you. And God says, I'm not having it. I'm going, to, I'm going to use you as an example. You're going to be blind till I say so. And that's going to show you that you don't mess with God's word. That's important. Now today, if the Lord struck everybody blind, it's trying to deceive people and turn them away. Uh, we have a lot of blind folks with them. The majority of folks walking around on the face of the earth would be blind, wouldn't they? Because they are blind spiritually. And if they're trying to turn somebody away from hearing the truth or stop the truth, and the Lord smote them blind, we just have a tremendous amount of blind folks. And the deputy, verse 12, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. He saw what was done. But what was the purpose of miracles? John chapter 20, verses 30, 31. I Many other signs truly did Jesus that are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe. Miracles are to produce faith on the part of people. That this is the work of God. Uh, now, when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John departed. Again, this is John Mark from them returning to Jerusalem, verse 13. Why did he go? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But for some reason or another, John Mark went back to Jerusalem. He, he didn't finish this journey. And, uh, you know, you, you don't want a soldier that, that deserts. What, what good is a deserter in, in the military? And he's a soldier of Christ, and they're over there, and they're doing a good work. And for some reason or another, if he was discouraged, if he missed his family, I don't know why, we're not told. But he turned around and went back. Turned around and went back. And a lot of people today turn around and go back, don't they? They start serving the Lord. And for certain reasons, they get discouraged, or this happens, or that happens. And they, they, they turn and leave the Lord and go back. And uh, we'll read about that later on in Acts chapter 15. On the next trip when they're going out, Barnabas wants to take John Mark. And Paul says, no, nope, not take him. Not profitable to take him. He, he, he left us. We, meet, we need people that's dependable. And there's contention between the two of them. The Bible says there was sharp contention. Now that's contention not over doctrine. It's contention over a matter of judgment. I'm going to take John Mark. I don't think it's wise to take John Mark. Would it, would it be a sin to take John Mark? No. Would it be a sin to leave John Mark at home? No. And they parted ways over that and got two new groups. Uh, Barnabas went with John Mark and Paul selected Silas. So now you've got two missionary journeys going out. Good came from it. But later, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul would say, Bring John Mark. He's profitable for the ministry. He redeemed himself. And we all make mistakes, don't we? But it's good when we can prove ourselves and redeem ourselves. All right. Any comment, observation from anyone? We're out of time. Very good. Thank you for your good attention. And we'll continue there our next time. Thank you. I think, uh,